He has been labeled as a genius, a prophet, a visionary, and sometimes as an eccentric and dismissed as an utopian dreamer. But in the end, no matter what they say, he's Jack Fresco, the creator and the mind behind the Venus Project, a monumental work of several fields of knowledge that unify the concept of a new future for the human civilization. Fresco's entire life is perhaps the definition of a second chance, a new opportunity for social progress in harmony with our planet and technology. Mr. Fresco, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for the privilege. Can you give us a brief description of what is the Venus Project? The Venus Project is an attempt to bring world peace and all the nations together. If you don't want war, killing, most crimes, you have to redesign the way society works. You have to declare all the Earth's resources as the common heritage of all the world's people. Then we have to remove the money system, which is basically corrupt. After that, we have to gradually outgrow the need for all the artificial boundaries that separate people. So we have one world working cooperatively toward preserving the environment and all life as we know it. And what is the most single important aspect of this project? A resource-based economy to declare all the resources the common heritage of all the world's people. Can you explain the distinction between a money-based economy and a resource-based economy? Well, a money-based economy produces incentive, but it also produces incentive for corruption, payoffs, paying off senators, various corporations, buying senators. It's never been a democracy. We've never had a democracy. No nation's ever had it. If you don't have equal purchasing power, you can't have a democracy. How does the Venus Project compare with communism? Communism uses money. It has social stratification. It has banks. It has armies and navies, prisons and police. We don't have any of those. Now let's talk about society. In many of your lectures, you imply that we are conditioned to think in a certain way. Is that correct? Well, if you were raised by the headhunters of the Amazon as a baby, if you never saw anything else, you'd be a headhunter. If you were raised in Nazi Germany, where all you see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland over others, you'd be a German. So I think all people are perfectly well adjusted where they're coming from. There's no such thing of good or bad people. You're taught to hate certain people, but where they're coming from is normal. If you're brought up in the South, uneducated region, you might become a member of the Ku Klux Klan. You speak with a southern accent. Where do you get that from? The environment. Where do you get, I'm going to give me a nigger and I'm going to kick his ass? You get that from the environment. It's not that people are good or bad. They're raised in an aberrated or twisted environment. Do you feel that we live in a world of damaged communications that sometimes restrict the language and expression of emotions as well as thinking? Is that correct? Yes. Today, our language is hundreds of years old. That makes it extremely difficult to talk to one another. We talk at each other. That means sometimes a person says, have a nice weekend. Why don't they say, have a nice life? Why just a weekend? Because our language is so old, it's automatic and has no meaning. There has to be a language that's not subject to interpretation. When you read the Bible, you say, Jesus meant this. He says, no, it meant that. In other words, he meant this. So you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, because it's subject to interpretation. A language is not subject to interpretation. Mathematics, engineering, chemistry, physics, structural engineering, not subject to interpretation. You couldn't build a bridge if one engineer says, I think he meant this. The other says, no, he meant that. So it's possible to develop a language not subject to interpretation. And how do you feel about the term democracy? Democracy is a con game. It's a word invented to placate people, to make them accept a given institution. All institutions sing, we are free. The minute you hear freedom and democracy, watch out. Because in a truly free nation, no one has to tell you you're free. I heard that you said that as powerful systems start to collapse, they tend to defend themselves with fascism in order to defend the status quo. 
Is that the situation that we live right now? Well, this system right now is moving toward fascism, cutting back on the freedoms, what little freedoms we had. We never had complete freedom, because the word freedom has no meaning. When an Arab comes to this country with ten wives, they say he can only come in with one. So don't use the word freedom. Say there's a certain range of behavior we permit in this society, and this is what it is. Don't use the word freedom. How do you feel about the recent economic crisis in the United States and the global recession? Is that a lesson to be learned? No, because it takes a recession, loss of job, and loss of respect for your elected leaders. When that happens, you get social change. Social change cannot come about due to intellect. It comes about by people suffering. And the more people that are laid off, the more they lose respect for an existing government, they will seek another direction. If there are too many people seek a new direction, then the existing government calls upon the military and police to manage society. That's called fascism. Now let's talk about war and technology. In 1961, President Eisenhower advised us against the military complex. Is this a prophecy to be taking care right now at this point of time? Well, I would say that he didn't push it enough. He should have explained it from many points of view. Just saying, beware of the industrial military complex is not enough, because people don't know what that means exactly. Yes, but we have seen the images of the Twin Towers being collapsed to the ground on 9-11. We also have seen the bombs going into the ground of these Middle East countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. How do you feel about this? And what's your perception of the future in the war? Each system wants to perpetuate itself. We don't go to another country to bring democracy. We go there for their resources, oil, metals, cheap labor. We don't go to bring democracy. We took this land from the Indians. We stole it. After we took the land, we took uh, New Mexico from Mexico. Then we took California from Spain. After we stole all the land we need, we put up the sign, Thou shalt not steal. All nations are corrupt, all of them. Now, one nation is, knows enough about ecology to handle the problems. All politicians are basically ignorant men, all of them, all the way back in history. Our problems are not political. They were good a hundred years ago, but today they're technical. Safe transportation, production of an abundance, making things available to people without the use of money. As long as money exists, you're going to have corruption. No matter how many treaties you sign, no matter how many laws you make, 90% of man-made laws are irrelevant. It isn't laws that we need. People need access to the necessities of life. When that's arranged, they don't steal. Some people say that always, always come back. Ambition, violence, hatred. What do you think about that? There's no such thing as human nature. Otherwise, we'd still be living in caves if human nature couldn't be changed. It's learned. When your mother says you're a Lutheran, you don't play with that little Catholic boy. So the parents indoctrinate their children. In the future, parents will be educated in how to raise children. You have to raise children because children can learn anything at all. They can learn geology, physics, chemistry, but we give them garbage. We have Mickey Mouse clubs in America. How shameful. We have uh, children and we read to them Dicky Dare and his sheep on the way he met a cow. Moo Moo said the cow. That's no way to raise children. Do you know they won't listen to you. So why persist on these ideals? Well, because they're brought up not to. In other words, they're brought up to, what's the greatest country in the world? The USA. What's, uh, what's the most inventive country in the world? The USA. But they don't tell us where the printing press came from. That all the foreigners that came to this country brought with them language, religion, ideas, technology, so we owe so much. For example, if you don't know this, an Arab named Algebra gave us algebra. The great museum in Egypt years ago had a library of world knowledge. So we owe so much to so many nations. The separation of nations is dangerous, wrong, and the failure of nations to work together. That's what war is. War is a supreme failure 
of bridging the difference between nations. There'll be no military in the future. There'll be people who learn. See, soldiers are killing machines. You teach them to kill, and the other nation teaches its soldiers to kill. What I would do is teach soldiers, send them back to school free of charge, to learn to become problem solvers. How do you bridge the difference between Saudi Arabia and this country? How do you bridge the difference between Venezuela and another country? That's what's needed. Science applied to government. So far, we have opinions from, from politicians that know nothing about ecology, safety, engineering, increasing the agricultural yield. They are totally incapable. And the future will look back the children of you say, couldn't you see that the money system had people paid off? Couldn't you see? Wasn't it obvious to you? You say, well, no, we were brought up and we didn't know the difference. Kids will not understand that in the future. Mr. Fresco, I want to thank you for your time. I'm sure our viewers enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege.